Good morning or good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to day five of Extended Learning. Uh, today we're going to focus on the Pacific Theater battles of World War II. Before we get to the notes, though, uh, just a couple comments. If you uh, have any suggestions for improvement, uh, any feedback about how my first video lecture went, uh, let me know. Um, I know that ran a little long, didn't uh, quite mean for that uh, to happen, but I guess, you know, there was a lot of information that we had to get uh, through. Um, this um, Pacific Theaters is only one page, uh, you know, so half the material, uh, so it should go uh, quite a bit quicker. Um, but, you know, I'm open to any kind of feedback that you want to send my way, so um, just send me an email and I'll uh, I'll do what I can to make things uh, a little bit better. Um, I'm a little, uh, not little, I'm a lot frustrated that I can't be with you guys in person um, to share all this information because there are so many interesting stories uh, and just bits of information that, you know, just sort of lose um, some emphasis, I guess, uh, through this uh, format of teaching. But it's the best we can do right now. And, uh, uh, you know, we'll make the best of it, I guess. Um, so, uh, that being said, let's, let's jump into it. What you're looking for, um, again, if you, uh, were with me or if you picked this up at school, you know, it's the Pacific theater notes on the back side is the atomic bomb and decision to use them notes. We'll get to that, uh, when we come back from spring break. So in the meantime, it's just that, that front page. Everything you, you need um, is also attached uh, to this assignment on Canvas. So um, uh, I, think we're, I think we're good to go here. So um, I mentioned you know, in, the, in the last lecture that um, we, we, we think of World War II starting on September 1st, 1939 with Japan, I'm sorry, ah, with Germany invading Poland. But I, I also mentioned in that video that um, you know, some people could could make the argument that it started in 1931, like it says there, when Japan invaded Manchuria, or even 1937, um, when uh, they invaded China, um, because uh, you know Europe and Hitler s sort of uh, get the bulk of the attention. Um, I, you know, 1939 is considered the start of the war, but clearly there were a lot of hostilities already going on on the other side of the world. You'll notice there in letter B, it says that China was experiencing a civil war. You would think that China, a country with a much larger population, uh, would have been able to fight off a much smaller country in Japan. But like it says there, they were experiencing a civil war and uh, the Japanese were really able to take advantage of that. Uh, you know, the, Jap the, the, the Chinese government was not united in their ability to um, put together a good, strong defense of their country. And, um, you know, the, the, there were communists fighting against nationalists. Now, they did manage to put their, their, um, their civil war aside for a while and, you know, try and defend the country against the Japanese. But they really weren't prepared for war like the Japanese were. Um, Japan, uh, like I said in the last lecture too, needed raw materials. Um, they wanted to um, control their own destiny in Asia and uh, they wanted to be an empire like some of the countries of Europe and the way they saw the United States. And so um, they thought the best way to do that would be to take from their neighbors rather than to you know trade, which is a much more peaceful way of doing it. So um, you notice there, I've got additional writing about the League of Nations. You know, the League of Nations, which again was formed after World War I, really proved to be ineffective. Uh, they, they had no authority to do anything when a country did something that was considered, uh, a, you know, against the charter of the League of Nations. And so, um, you know, all they could do was say, you know, shame on you, Japan. And Japan, you know, pretty much just ignored them. Uh, this is uh, the Pen A incident. You know, it's not in your notes, but it's worth uh, paying a little bit of attention to. Um, the Pen A was an American boat that was um, operating in China, and it, along with three uh, U.S. oil tankers, 
were attacked by the Japanese when they uh, invaded China. And um, I think our, our response to this Japanese act of aggression sent a strong message to the Japanese that the United States really wasn't interested in going to war. Uh, and, um, you know, in much the same way that Hitler's early aggression uh, taught, um, uh, or I should say France and Great Britain's response to Hitler's early aggression taught Hitler and the Germans that they could do a lot without getting in trouble. And our reaction to what the Japanese did, which was pretty much say, you know, you shouldn't have done that and we want an apology, um, that that told the Japanese that uh, the United States is um, pretty weak and pretty interested in remaining isolationist and we can do what we want in China and nobody's going to stand in our way. Uh, so this map, uh, you'll notice, um, is, is of, of Japan, it's of the Pacific. There's lots of little islands here. That line in red um, really shows the extent of the Japanese uh, conquest. Um, you know, and this is in uh, the spring, early summer, uh, 1942. Uh, you notice up in the top uh, right hand, there's um, what's called the Aleutian Islands, and the Aleutian Islands are sort of the tail of Alaska. Uh, there, there were uh, Japanese expeditions into this area uh, and really into um, Alaska, and um, you know, so that was sort of the extent of them being on um, you know American territory, uh, and. Um, uh, it's sort of an interesting little little forgotten part of, of the war, um, but there was fighting between Americans and Japanese up in the Alaska, the tail of, of Alaska. Uh, notice Hawaii uh, on, the, on the very right-hand side of the map. Um, of course, that's where Pearl Harbor happens. And then to the left of that, you'll see the Midway Islands um, in the Battle of Midway. Uh, that, was, um, that will become an important part of the war as well. All right, let's keep going. So um, we introduced the attack, uh, the Pearl Harbor attack in the first set of notes or the last week's notes, but a um, uh, little bit more detail about it today. The person on the bottom left is Admiral uh, Irisako Yamamoto, who was the brainchild of the Pearl Harbor attack. Yamamoto was the um, uh, he designed it. He he uh, planned it. Um, it. He was actually educated at Harvard. He had spent time in the United States. He understood America very well. Yamamoto, um, interestingly enough, never really believed that the Japanese could defeat the United States. He recognized that the United States had great industrial capacity. His hope was that the Japanese could strike such a devastating blow on the United States that it would knock out our will to fight, that we would look at the Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor and say, wow, we don't want to mess with them. Let's just pull back and leave them alone. And, and you know, hopefully they won't bother us anymore. Um, Clearly, that was not our response, but that was, you know, one of the goals of the Japanese to, um, you know, destroy our will to fight, uh, essentially. Uh, in the uh, notes that you took on the video that you watched, one of the questions I asked was about um, American aircraft carriers, uh, and um, that was a goal of the Japanese to, to knock out our aircraft carriers. Fortunately, they weren't there. Um, they would play a really pivotal role in, in the rest of the war, and we got very fortunate that they were not uh, in Pearl Harbor when the attack came. You'll notice um, uh, on this slide and on the handout that you guys have, it says the Japanese attacked on December 7th, 1949. Clearly, that's not correct. You're going to want to change that on your paper to 41. Um, I... Unfortunately, this is a locked PDF, and I can't get in there to do that. But um, you're going to want to make that change manually, so you don't you don't forget that come test day. 
Um, again, also in the video, you know, they talked about how not only did the Japanese attack uh, Hawaii and Pearl Harbor, they attacked lots of other um, islands in the South Pacific, and um, including Wake Island, Midway Island, and then the Philippine Islands. The Philippine Islands were important because, if you remember, those were uh, American territory. That was an American colony. You know, that was one of the things that we acquired after the Spanish-American War. Um, so essentially, they were attacking more U.S. territory. At least that's how we felt. And that's why there were U.S. soldiers um, and airmen uh, on the island when that attack came. We'll talk more about that a little bit later on. Um, in the upper right, you notice a small submarine in the, uh, uh, in the, on the slide here. Uh, the reason I included that was because, and this is a really fascinating story that not too many people um, know about or, or think about when they think about Pearl Harbor. Not only did the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor with 300 plus aircraft, um, and that's you know truly what did the bulk of the damage. They also attacked with five little mini submarines. These were small one-man submarines that maybe had one or two torpedoes on them. Uh, they were brought from Japan to the mouth of Pearl Harbor on what were called mother subs, and then they were released uh, sort of the night before, and they made their way towards uh, towards um, you know, Pearl Harbor and. Um, you know, the goal was to see, well, let's see what damage those torpedoes could do. Um, and the only reason we know that they actually even existed was because one of them, the one pictured there, uh, actually washed up on shore. Uh, the, um, and the pilot uh, was captured. So uh, even before the, um, the war began, we had taken our first Japanese prisoner. Um, the other four subs sunk. Uh, and were um, really not effective in any way. But it was an attempt by the Japanese to just basically use everything they had. Um, unfortunately, an American warship spotted one of these little subs uh, the night before the attack and fired on it um, and, and disabled it. And you would have thought that that interaction would have alerted the people on um, at Pearl Harbor that, you know, something, we should be on high alert here, um, but it didn't. That, that information sort of didn't make it down the chain of command, and, um, you know, we, we lost an opportunity to be ready for the Japanese when they, when they struck. Um, so this map uh, is really just a picture of uh, a map that is actually at Pearl Harbor that uh, sort of shows where um, some of the ships were when um, the attack occurred. Uh, the ones pictured in red were the ones that were sunk. Um, not only were there uh, ships at Pearl Harbor of all sorts and sizes, there were also um, some airfields that were attacked um, and, um, and oil reserves as well. So lots of uh, uh, targets for the Japanese. Some aerial shots of Pearl Harbor um, before and after the attack. Um, this is a picture above what was known as Battleship Row. You can see sort of the, the battleships just lined up there. Um, easy targets for the Japanese pilots. And then, of course, a series of pictures that show the devastation of the oil fields and the airfields and the ships um, just going, going up in flames. Um, and then, of course, the USS Arizona, where the bulk of the casualties of Pearl Harbor came from, um, the Arizona, and I don't remember if this was talked about in the video or not, uh, but the Arizona was um, uh, really, I guess, just the victim of, of unfortunate um, accuracy by the Japanese pilot to drop that bomb. It, it landed right in a magazine uh, cache of, of ammunition and just blew the ship apart. And um, it sunk very, very quickly, trapping over 1,700 sailors on board. Um, I know some in the past, some of my students have been to the Arizona Memorial uh, at Pearl Harbor. Um, and we, you know, I would, would love if you guys could share your stories of seeing it. Um, you know, feel free to 
um, you know, should put that on a discussion in Canvas um, so others could see it. Uh, the, the memorial is something that you take a little shuttle boat out to, which you sort of see in that bottom right hand picture. And, um, and it's the memorial is right over what the remains of the ship. The ship itself is um, a burial ground because, like I said, there are over 1,700 souls that are buried there, um, and uh, the ship is sort of falling apart over the over the years. But it's an important reminder of what happened. Um, so this is just a chart of of what um, happened uh, at Pearl Harbor: the the number of ships that were lost or damaged. Um, really, of all the ships that were um, hit, only three of them were completely lost. You know, two battleships were completely destroyed, uh, the Oklahoma and the Arizona, and then another um, support ship was, was completely sunk and, and destroyed as well. Um, lost a lot of aircraft, but um, most of the ships were, they were able to be repaired and put back into service relatively quickly. So, um, like I said at the beginning of this, the Japanese had really hoped to uh, knock the U.S. Uh, out of the war or even really prevent us from joining the war, um, you know, essentially hit us so hard that we wouldn't want to even mess with the Japanese. Um, and that clearly didn't happen. You know, the picture there, the bottom left, that's some propaganda um, picture in the upper right, Avenge Pearl Harbor. Um, there were, um, you know, recruiting stations around the country uh, were filled with young men eager to volunteer. Uh, the day after, President uh, Roosevelt addresses Congress and, and asks for a declaration of war, and of course that comes. Um, there, there was no hesitation on the American, uh, of the American response. Another reason why the attack failed was um, those aircraft carriers, right? That was a real target for the Japanese, and um, not getting those aircraft carriers was a, a definite um, uh, failure on their part. And then the third reason why I, I would say that the attack failed was because the Japanese, um, if they couldn't convince us not to join the war, their other goal was to at least hit us so hard that it would take us two years, maybe a year and a half, two years, before we could even um, be ready to fight them, right? It would take us a couple of years to rebuild the Navy. Um, and then they would have two years to fortify their defenses throughout the Pacific, right? Really build up their strength and get all the resources they needed. Uh, that did not happen as well. We were ready to go. We got those ships repaired. We got them back up into service in really just a matter of months uh, and just a few months. And so, um, you know, by by April of of uh, 1942, um, we're in action and we're striking back. And then by June of 1942, we we win really the most pivotal battle of the war in the Pacific. So. Um, things, things, we, we were able to turn things around, you know, much quicker than the Japanese anticipated. Okay. So, um, in the video, again, you guys, you guys, um, saw the Doolittle Raid. You answered a couple of questions about it. The Doolittle Raid was, um, just what America needed at that point in time, right? Um, we, we got, we got our asses handed to us at Pearl Harbor, um, the, the Philippines were captured and Americans were taken prisoner. Uh, it, it, things didn't look very good for us at all. And the Doolittle Raid, uh, while it was not a military success, right? Um, 16 bombers, they're not going to be able to do a lot of damage. Um, they missed the, the tank factory. They hit some utility companies. But it was um, a great moral victory for the United States, right? We demonstrated to the Japanese that they weren't isolated, that we could get to them, which really shocked them. And it made us feel good. It made the American people feel like finally we were doing something. Um, it would actually also cause the Japanese to feel like they had to strike one more time at the American Navy to really knock us out 
because by hitting Tokyo, um, we put their emperor in harm's way. And their emperor, you know, again, to them was a living God. And so they were shocked that we could, you know, get so close to him. And so they felt like they had to uh, really, um, you know, take out our, our, our aircraft carriers once and for all. And that would lead to this very pivotal battle. Um, so um, a lot of good things came out of the Doolittle Raid. Um, the Bataan Death March. I think this, this was the last part of the video that you guys watched. And it was the last two questions you had to answer. Um, this was really horrific, right? So, um, you know, most of the prisoners, I think there were about 12,000 American prisoners and some 50, 60,000 Filipino prisoners, um, you know, that were fighting alongside the United States that were taken, taken captive. Uh, the Japanese were just horrifically brutal. Um, they just, they didn't recognize any of the, the rules of war and how prisoners are supposed to be treated. Um, and, um, just really inhumane barbaric conditions that the prisoners uh, had to deal with. Again, the Philippine Islands was a colony of the United States, so we weren't attacking them. They were attacking us. Um, and the last question that you guys were asked to answer was, you know, why did the, why did the Japanese treat the American prisoners so brutally? And um, you all had good answers, but most of you didn't quite get it. And that's okay, because uh, I don't think we really talked about it. We're going to talk about it um, uh, actually in, in, a, in a couple of slides here. But the Japanese didn't believe that a soldier should surrender, right? That to, to surrender was a sign of, of dishonor. You were disgracing yourself if you, if you surrendered. Because the Japanese were fighting for their emperor, right? They were fighting for their living God. And um, it was honorable to fight to the death not to surrender. And when the Americans and the Filipinos surrendered, well, they had given up their honor. And if they give up their honor, then, then the Japanese felt like they could treat them any way they wanted. They could treat them, you know, like dogs. And, you know, that's what they did. They treated them worse than dogs. Now, I think it went beyond that, because if you look at what happened in China, specifically in Nanking, uh, part of the video you watched, the Japanese were just horrific wherever they went. They, they just had adopted this, this brutal mentality of, of, you know, destruction of everything where they went. And, um, so I think the, I think the dishonor part was, was some of it, but I think part of it was just their, their nature at that time of, of just being terribly brutal. Okay. Um, so much like the European theater writing assignment, your assignment um, for this section of notes uh, involves choosing one of two battles, the Battle of Midway or the Battle of Okinawa. And um, again, like you did with the other, uh, describe the events of the battle and what was important about it in connection to the total war effort. And then you, you send that writing sample uh, to turn it in. Uh, and I've got uh, on, on the on the uh, canvas assignment, as you can see, or you've seen already, I've got a clip about the battle of Midway, uh, really fascinating. And then I've got a clip about the battle of Okinawa as well. Um, both really gripping, uh, stories. I, I encourage you to watch them both take your time, uh, you know, soak it in, um, you know, really learn what happened. These are, these are really important battles in American history. Um, so, you know, as that map showed, and as the map uh, we looked at earlier showed, the Japanese had taken control of lots of small islands throughout the Pacific. Um, and on these islands, they had built airfields, um, and then they could fly their planes and attack American ships from these various airfields on these tiny little islands. And so it became important for the United States to capture each one of these islands so that they could capture these airfields and the American ships wouldn't be vulnerable to attack. Uh, and so that became what was known as an island hopping strategy, hopping from one island, taking it, going to the next island, taking it, 
uh, so on and so forth, and we would get closer and closer and closer uh, to the Japanese main islands. The strategy was a lot harder than it sounded, though, because the Japanese had um, spent many months, perhaps even years, building up very strong defenses on these islands. And so um, when, the, when the American Marines landed, they were often met with well dug in soldiers who made getting onto the islands extremely difficult and frankly, extremely deadly. And then the island them, islands themselves were, you know, less than hospitable. Some of these islands were not much more than coral reefs. Some of these islands were just um, uh, volcanic islands, um, not places where, uh, you know, very hospitable. And you notice there it talks about 100 degree heat and, you know, jungles and diseases. These were miserable places to be. Uh, so notice that Japanese motto, death before dishonor, once again, talking about the, the, the Japanese code of fighting to the death. That was something else that made taking each one of these islands so much more difficult. The Japanese were not, not gonna surrender easily, right? Uh, you would see soldiers charging American uh, Marines um, with, with bamboo sticks, just because they didn't want to surrender. They would rather be killed in battle than, than, to, than to surrender. And, and when they ran out of ammunition, that's what they did. Uh, and so um, just, just um, yeah, horrific death tolls as, um, and the closer we got to the Japanese main islands, the harder and harder the, uh, the Japanese soldiers fought. And then, of course, kamikaze, an important term to know. Kamikaze actually is a Japanese word that means divine wind. Um, and, and as the United States got closer and it looked more desperate for the Japanese, they began filling their planes with um, fuel and bombs and explosives and then flying them into American ships. Um, you know, human, human uh, suicide bombers, essentially. And, you know, that's, that shows the fanaticism of the Japanese soldier, their willing, willingness to just, you know, give their life in, in, a, in a futile, desperate way to try and stop the American advance towards uh, the main islands. So the Battle of Midway, I don't know if you've watched the video yet or not. Um, if you haven't, um, I would encourage you maybe maybe pause this part of the notes and watch the video um, or certainly watch it when you're done with the notes. But it's a fascinating story. Um, what's really fascinating about it, and, and you get this from the video, I think, um, the how the Americans were able to break the Japanese code and um, figure out where the Japanese were going to attack next. Um, and you got to give a lot of credit to the uh, naval intelligence, to the to code breakers that were able to um, figure out, you know, what the Japanese code was and then be able to use that to, um, you know, anticipate their attacks. The British were able to do that along with uh, working together with the United States um, to, to figure out the German code as well. And we had some other um, uh, events that helped us with that. But uh, on both, both theaters, um, the intelligence part of the war was just as important as the military part because knowing what the enemy was going to do um, really gave us an advantage. Um, so the Battle of Midway becomes really, really important. Um, in this battle, the Japanese end up losing four aircraft carriers. You know, their goal for this battle was to knock out the American aircraft carrier fleet. And instead, we turn the tide and we destroy their four big aircraft carriers. And they did not have the industrial capacity to rebuild those um, like we could, right? Um, and so this was a devastating blow. So this is June of 1942. The war would go on for three more years, but this becomes the turning point of the war in the Pacific. Put a star next to that. Again, like Saratoga in the Revolutionary War, like Gettysburg in the Civil War, like Stalingrad in Europe, 
Midway is the turning point of the war in the Pacific because after Midway, the Japanese offensive capability is weakened, right? They, they are forever weakened by losing these four um, big aircraft carriers and they lost a lot of planes and more importantly, they lost a lot of pilots um, in this attack because when the aircraft carriers go down, the planes have nowhere to land and so these pilots just you know, crashed in the sea and died. Um, so um, this was um, a tremendous victory. But again, like I said, watch the video. It's a, it's a fascinating story. We almost lost this battle. Um, we, this was literally pulling victory from the jaws of defeat. Um, so yeah, there's a little bit more information um, about it and um, not on your notes, but um, things that you can write down, things that might help you um, tease out a good response for your, um, your assignment if you choose to write on the Battle of Midway. And then um, the Battle of Guadalcanal. Um, this isn't one of the ones you can choose to write from, but this was a, a tremendously important battle. The Japanese were moving closer to um, uh, Australia, actually, and, and putting that part of uh, the Allied forces in, in jeopardy. And the Battle of Guadalcanal was a months long uh, air, sea, and ground battle uh, between the US and Japan, of course. And um, by stopping the, the Japanese at Guadalcanal, um, again, we're turning the tide of the war here. One of the great things about World War II is that there are a lot of interesting movies made about the war. Um, Europe, the war in Europe, the war against the Nazis tends to get a lot of the focus, but these are just a couple examples of some of the movies that have been made, uh, in the, in, in the relative, you know, like the last 20 years or so that are really good. Um, the Pacific is, is actually where you, we get the clip from the battle of Okinawa that you're, you're going to look at, or maybe you've already looked at, uh, the battle of Iwo Jima. Um, this is a very iconic picture um, and there's a memorial in Washington DC uh, that um, reenacts this. This was the flag raising uh, on Mount Suribachi, the highest point on Iwo Jima. Um, we're getting closer, much closer to the Japanese home islands now and um, uh, the Battle of Iwo Jima was um, dramatic in lives lost. As you can see, over 20,000 Japanese killed, 6,000 U.S. lives lost trying to take this tiny little island. Really, you know, not much more than a volcanic island. Um, we were able to capture in just a couple of days uh, Mount Suribachi, which is where the Marines and the naval, um, uh, uh, the sailors, um, were able to raise this flag. It would take us another month to capture the rest of the island. You know, that's again, how well the, the Japanese were dug in uh, on Iwo Jima. Um, uh, some more information. The pictures there, uh, you know, Mount Suribachi is the, the high pop part uh, of that picture in the bottom right. The other pictures show just how difficult it was for the Marines to get on shore, right? Because the, the Japanese were dug in so well as they tried to get off the landing craft they were just being mowed down, much like what happened um, in D-Day at, um, uh, at Omaha Beach. Notice there on this slide, more U.S. Marines earning the Medal of Honor uh, on Iwo Jima than in any other battle in U.S. history. Uh, and, and virtually all the Japanese that were on the island were killed, again, showing their unwillingness to surrender. Another, um, a couple of good movies. This is a, the, this set of movies is really interesting. These were both directed by Clint Eastwood, um, who has you know, really shown his, his medal as a great filmmaker. Um, the flags of our fathers and the letters of Iwo Jima, they were made, uh, essentially at the same time, telling a story about the same battle, but from different perspectives. So flags of our fathers is the battle shown from the perspective of an American soldier and letters from Iwo Jima is again, the same battle, 
shown from the perspective of a Japanese soldier, right? So you can see um, both perspectives. And like I said, two different movies made at the same time, sort of interconnected. It's a fascinating filmmaking technique used by Clint Eastwood. Uh, and then we get to the Battle of Okinawa. Uh, and hopefully you've had a chance to see the video. Again, I, I would recommend doing that maybe before you read all this. But um, Okinawa was the, the costliest battle um, of the war in the Pacific, right? So the Battle of the Bulge was the costliest war, uh, the costliest battle of World War II for the United States. But on the Pacific side, the Battle of Okinawa was the costliest um, Again, this was the, the, the last island that the United States had to get to before we would start the main Japanese islands. And um, so the, 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 the unwillingness for the Japanese to surrender, their, their ferocity of fighting just continued to get uh, more and more intense. Um, you can see um, 100,000 civilians perish in the battle. Um, you see civilian, this is where you see civilians committing suicide, jumping off of cliffs rather than being captured by the Americans because the, the Japanese had told the Okinawan citizens that if they were captured by the Americans, they would be raped, they would be tortured. Um, and so there was this fear that, you know, that they would be hurt. Um, the brutality on Okinawa was staggering. And like I said, I hope, hopefully you'll get that. Uh, from the video. I encourage you to watch that. Um, so we've come to the end of the Pacific Theater. Like I said, the Battle of Okinawa was the last um, island before um, the, the Americans had to take the, the home islands. America had a choice to make. I, um, how, do we, how do we finish off the Japanese? There was uh, an unwillingness of the Japanese to surrender. We, we had seen that. And uh, the idea of having to invade the Japanese home islands was um, very frightening because like it says there, there was an expectation that we might lose a million American soldiers, right? Whether in, in dead or wounded uh, in, um, What the Japanese didn't know, and frankly, what most Americans didn't know, was um, that we had the atomic bomb that could be used to end the war. When we come back from um, spring break, we're going to talk about uh, the war at home and how that was being fought, uh, how the government was getting Americans involved in support for the war. And then eventually we're going to talk about the use of the atomic bomb and the decision-making process that American leaders used to decide whether that should be um, used against the Japanese. You are going to have a chance to weigh in on that as well. I'm going to give you some, you know, different perspectives and then I want your opinion because the use of the atomic bomb is, is still, you know, 70 plus years later, still very controversial. Um, should it have been used? Could it have been, could, have, could we have ended the war without using it? Um, was it the right or wrong thing to do? Uh, we'll, we'll look at that together as a class. Um, so again, one more time, just a quick reminder, um, choose one of those two battles, um, answer the question there, describe the, describe the events and explain the importance and the connection to the total war effort. Um, and if you have any questions, just email me. Some of you have already been doing that, which is great. Um, if the techno, if you're having any trouble with the technology, uh, again, feel free to just send me an email about that and we'll see if we can work it out. Um, and, uh, you know, also, you know, if, you, if the textbook doesn't open, just use Google, that'll work too. Uh, but, um, like I said, the videos, I think they're really good, gives you some good information, good perspective, and just do your best. Um, I think I mentioned this the last time I was talking to Mr. Reynolds earlier today and I just, and I was talking to my son, frankly, and, and this, you know, it just really sucks that we're, we're having to learn. You guys are having to learn this because there's so much I'd, I'd love to share with you and be able to emphasize the importance of some of this stuff. Um, but this is what we got. This is what we're going to do. Um, so good luck. Um, oh, got a couple birthdays today. So, um, uh, Ivan, 
yeah, Ivan and Zara, uh, happy birthday to you. And um, uh, anybody who's got a birthday coming up, um, happy birthday as well. And um, I think that's it. So I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.